All right, uh, welcome everybody to the uh, November Growers Conference call. Uh, so, Jim will be starting. You guys? Okay. Sorry, I got muted again. Um, Jim will be starting us off uh, for the first little while, and then Excellent. Uh, Todd James Excellent. and and uh, Glenn Miller are going to be coming on for the latter part of the call to discuss the November uh, calendar picture, uh, as well as a few other things. Uh, so I'll I'll do introductions at that point. Let me get my uh, nose. So my eye drop. For every, uh, same for every call. Uh, if you have a question, please hold it until uh, like a break in the discussion. And if you wish to unmute or mute yourself, it's star six. Uh, Jim, are you good to go? Yeah, I'm good to go, Zach. Okay. <clears throat> I don't know. Carla hit the right button, but uh, she sure cleaned uh, cleaned things up a little bit. And I don't I don't have near the echo. Uh, my name is Jim oh, Albison. Better for me too. Good, good. I'm working on the first uh, first part of the call here, and uh, we we'll just uh, talk a few current events uh, before we uh, before we get started. I've got uh, several gentlemen that are from different areas of the country, and what they're going to do is talk about uh, the harvest and what's going on. Uh, it seems like uh, at this point the uh, winter storm that went through has got everybody in neutral. I was talking with David uh, here down in Illinois, and he said uh, they're pretty well stopped at this point, as we are from snow laying on the corn uh, we had about four inches at home and about eight inches here in Milan. And uh, Dave was saying how the the snow was very thick on the uh, corn at home, and that's the situation that we've got. It's come off to a certain degree, but it hasn't blown off. It's pretty well melted off. And what we're thinking is the rain that we had right before the snow came in made that uh, fodder sticky, and the snow was able to hang right to it because uh, there was a good couple inches uh, hung right on the on the foliage of the plant itself. So nobody basically can run at this point till that gets off of there. I'd say maybe late tomorrow, possibly Saturday in our area, there might be some guys trying some stuff. But uh, other than that, there's not a whole lot going on. A um, few of the current events, uh, the last report that came out on Monday, again, they haven't changed much on it. Uh, they've got the yield. They dropped it a little bit, and then uh, the total harvested acres, basically the same, down a little bit. Uh, but then they've tinkered with the export numbers, so everything is pretty well about the same. Now the whole uh, trade is basically talking about the injury to the crop, uh, especially in the northern tier, uh, Dakotas, Minnesota, and uh, this late season corn, and Steve Geiger will talk a little bit about that. These guys running this corn when you've got very high moisture, very low test weight, the amount of starch left in the kernel is going to be a big problem. And uh, this is going to cut back on the amount uh, uh, or increase the amount that's needed by everybody in order to feed out or even to make ethanol the usage is going to be significantly higher, which is going to cut the yield back. And the government pretty well is ignoring that. And the trade is saying that could be a very significant situation and cut the production uh, at a pretty good clip. Uh, again, the trade is saying Brazil is going to make up all the difference. Argentina is going to make up all the difference. Uh, again, I think they realize that there is a serious problem out there. So uh, as we go along, I think we're going to see that the, the difficulty of this year is, is going to be a big problem with total production. Uh, another thing, uh, we've been getting an awful a lot of people discussing this cannabis thing, and uh, we have several areas of uh, North America that we're working with where our customers have actually used growers uh, on the cannabis. Uh, so we have a little bit of experience with this. Uh, we've been talking with our uh, chemical people that uh, are, are telling us what the analysis of some of this stuff should be. In other words, uh, when they start looking at you know, CBD oil and that type of thing and human consumption, 
that that brings up a whole myriad of testing that uh, we aren't seeing in the food chain. Uh, for example, the uh, microbial content of the cannabis itself, depending on you know whether you're using it for uh, oil or if they're actually taking the oil and putting it into different types of other products that are consumed by the human, uh, that that brings up a whole different avenue. The residual of chemical, uh, we're talking organic radicals like herbicide, for example. In some cases, guys aren't allowed to use any kind of uh, uh, organic radical, whether it be herbicide, pesticide. And then the other issue that uh, is definitely a big issue with cannabis is heavy metal testing. And see, this right away, several uh, people are telling us that uh, when they are working with the people that they're getting the cannabis plants from, they're telling them that they need to use their particular fertilizer because uh, they know that the regular commercial fertilizers that most people are using are uh, heavy in particularly cadmium and arsenic, which is a couple of the heavy metals that they're looking at quite significantly in cannabis. And again, we know growers, uh, since uh, we've been using it as a feed supplement, that this is something we paid attention to from day one. And again, with foliar feeding and using it uh, as a roast starter, uh, we have addressed those particular issues. So again, uh, we think from the quality standpoint, uh, this is something that's going to be uh, uh, fit right in with the grower's program and using the grower's product. So uh, we'll kind of keep everybody in the loop on that. We'll be discussing a little bit in the solutions. Uh, and then if you have any questions, we've we've also made an effort this year. There's been a lot of uh, demand for uh, tobacco brochures because we have people in different areas of the country. You know, in the South, we've been big in tobacco for years, uh, but we have other areas of the country that are – raising more tobacco, and there's a lot of interest in uh, new areas with tobacco, so we have put a brochure together. And what we're telling farmers is if they are looking at the cannabis, uh, that's a good brochure to start with. We don't refer to it directly in there, but uh, the guys that are uh, raising the cannabis are using uh, growers kind of in a similar methodology that they're using um, on tobacco. So, again, that's uh, for those of you that are looking at that and the guys that are repping for us, uh, that, uh, that'll be a starting point. And uh, Carlos got the initial copy on that. We've got to go to Terry Norris with it uh, for Terry to make sure every uh, T's are crossed, I's are dotted, so we got it correct. But uh, we should have one fairly soon. So if you have interest in that, uh, those of you who come to the annual meeting, there should be brochures by that we may have some before that or we can make some copies of the uh, finished product after it uh, goes through uh, different uh, critiques per se so so at this point uh, i i think i better start with uh, the gentleman i got on the line from the other from different areas of the country and lowell grove i'm going to let you start uh, lowell <clears throat> lives in hanover pennsylvania so he'll talk a little bit about the east and uh, what's going on there and what he had with his crop and what he's hearing from other guys that are in his area. So, Lowell, you got about five, six minutes to kind of give us a rundown on what you see in your area. Good evening, everybody. Do uh, you hear me, Jim? Or... Yep, yep, you're fine, Lowell. Go ahead. Okay. Talking about our crop. We planted our corn uh, the 20th of April, the 20th of May, 25th, and the 1st of June, and the, and the 4th of June. Because 2018 started, uh, 2019 started off a lot like 2018. We had work, we had wet soil to work with, and therefore we just waited, planted. Through the summer, the the corn came out. We did face some dry weather uh, in August. We faced some, you know, some, but not very much in our area. A lot of people felt uh, hindered in the yields and things like that. But uh, 
in church and around, harvest began in the middle of September with with one of the customers who's on hills and able to plant in April. Beginning in the middle of September, harvesting very good yields, having taken off 75 or 80 acres whenever I talked to him, running approximately 180 bushels at 16, 17% moisture. Myself, we didn't finish, we didn't take ours off till finished yesterday. Uh, I have no idea what yields is. All I know is probably the second best year we've had in 10 years. Uh, moisture's probably about 19%. Trucks kept getting full, and so we really didn't mind that part. In different areas around, we had different things. I haven't heard a lot about bean yields. I did hear of some corn yields that, you know, are way down because and people begin to question what's going on. Uh, we did have more sunshine than last year. And probably able to produce better quality crops. But over the last year we had trouble with low test wheat. Almost the buyer didn't want to take it. This year he hasn't said anything about that of test wheat or uh anyway he didn't reject it. Uh the corn. Uh bean yields I hear that are of course, with with the with the thing of corn low test yield that discussed one day with Paul Daughter, we we thought the microbes were probably well suppressed last year, and how long will it take to get them back? Because through the season, things did not seem to be uh, normal. But what is normal as far as growing crops? To me, there is no normal. Paul Daughter finished his harvest uh, just the other day. Bean yields, he said, were not down. We're down some, not really great yields. Uh, corn, thought they were doing all right, but I didn't get no yields on that as far as what, what it was average. Western Pennsylvania, no. Curtis Snapper told me that he had some late corn put out after barley and it turned dry in that area earlier than our area. And he um, thought surely the corn wouldn't do nothing. He, he went in there and I forget what he said he put on it, but later he thought he ought to go check on it. And even though it was dry, he was totally surprised as to what he was getting and Probably that attributes to the lime he's been spreading the last number of years. Also, getting the roots down further in the uh, soil profile. And he used an airway to help get oxygen in the soil. But he said he harvested this uh, in the fall here at 125 bushels. And, you know, he was well pleased with that. Western Pennsylvania, they were in the middle of harvest the other day when I was there. Beans, they said, were down, and some of their late beans, they should have just burned off and started over, but they saw it why burn off what they were there, and disappointed kind of with yields. Uh, corn, they felt they were doing all right. Again, I don't have no yields on that. Uh, Right now, I'm in Harrisonburg, Virginia. Uh, some places where we had a lot of lime on, late beans after wheat did 58 bushel. Some others said that they got dry and their later beans was nothing but BBs and, and then, of course, yield very good. But they felt that corn is... Corn is probably doing well. So, Jim asked for the East Coast. 
I'm not in these shows. You've got to ask my brother Dennis uh, that. But anyways, um, it seems like yields are over the map. Some are disappointed. Some are well happy with the yields coming in. And again, my question is, is what have people done to oxidize the soil? What are they doing about the microbes in the soil? And where Roger Kumran there was was um, started in early September, he thought after last year he was going to have to get his ripper out and rip again just because of all the rain for for that compacted the soil to get some oxygen in the soil. So I think that's two important factors: oxygen in the soil, and also feeding the microbes and let the microbes do their work. So how do we rate the crop? My truck driver's report is that they'll probably average about 120 bushel, about five or eight miles from me. So, you know, we have crops all over the record, and, you know, some are disappointed and some are really glad. What, hey, Lowell, what, 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 hey, hey, Lowell, what are guys saying about uh, feed as far as forage is concerned? Are they getting pretty decent forage yields, uh, like uh, hay crops and that, that you're the guys you're talking to? We ourselves have fairly decent hay crops. Uh, here in Virginia, they said the hay crop was, you know, their second crop hay was basically the the – just by making a lot of dust in the field and not getting very much. Um, mm-hmm. As far as salvage, some salvage yields I've been hearing about, like 23 tons, some 15 tons, some 18 tons. Um, mm-hmm. That's what I'm hearing, and I heard that here in Virginia. Uh, just other salvage yields I haven't. Uh, just really contacted with, but seems like you know up through Paul Fisher and things like that, they're they're having uh, good crops also. Okay. Sounds good, Lowell. Appreciate it very much. Okay, Steve Geiger, uh, I heard you before. Are you still there, Steve? Hey, I'm here, Jim. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Now I hear you. There you go. Okay. This is Steve. This is Steve Geiger. Uh, Steve's uh, located up in uh, Thumb of Michigan, and uh, I think for adversity, you know, uh, we've got uh, areas in the Dakotas that's gone through quite a bit of adversity, but I think uh, the Michigan boys have had their share of adversity also. So I'll let. Steve, chat a little bit about that and give you guys some kind of perspective about that. So this is Steve Geiger. Yeah, I spent this week um, visiting with my customers and traveling uh, northern and the northeast portion of the state, and uh, not a lot of good news coming from Michigan. Uh, Pretty much everywhere where I've traveled, and even uh, maybe not quite the southern part of Michigan, but most of the central north were frosted off between the last week in September to about the 15th of October. There was, uh, you got a killing frost between that window. And with late corn, uh, there was hardly any silage taken off yet, so most silage was taken off after it had frosted. i seen uh, silage being taken off this week yet. Uh, the day before yesterday, and it didn't look like a lot of fun in a snowstorm trying to harvest uh, corn silage, and I don't know what they're going to get out of it because it was pretty pretty dry looking to be taken off for silage. Um, I would say where I travel, it's a rarity to see a cornfield that's been thrashed. Uh, you see fields that have been chopped, but uh, hardly do you run across a corn field that's been thrashed. It's mainly all standing yet. Uh, it's got anywhere from six, eight inches of snow up to some places, three feet of snow on it this week. Um, and uh, moisture ranging anywhere from the mid-30s up into the high 40s is what guys have been telling me corn is doing. 
Um, so there's really nothing you can do with corn. Here and there, there's a guy that might have a field that's down into the mid-20s at the Shrine of Combine. But um, just it's a struggle. Uh, a few guys I've talked to with soybeans said that they've had some excellent spots in, in some fields, uh, some spotty fields. They ranged anywhere from tw- 20 bushel to 50 bushel, all in the same field. Uh, uh, the third cutting hay, I talked to a few guys that had just beautiful third cutting hay, and it's still standing out there. Yeah, they had a they had, uh, hay crop that was close to knee high for a th- uh, third cutting. And it rained and it <laughs> rained and it rained, and finally we got snow on it, and they said they'd love to have gotten it, but um, it's pretty darn hard to make hay when it's raining every day. Um mm-hmm. Not a lot of, not a lot of, not a lot of joy. The customers I'm talking with, they're going to come through it. They're doing fine. Uh, by all means, it's not a rosy year. Every single one of them had the uh, uh, contention that I'm, I will be glad to see this year pass. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> they're doing okay. They're making a feed value uh, where they full your fed. You can see an improvement over what the neighbors are doing. Uh, I had one guy that uh, was a first-year customer in northern Michigan that foliar fed his alfalfa three times this year, and the other night they counted 80 deer in it. Um, <laughs> so it is saying something. He's already had a few neighbors grumble that the deer aren't on my land. What's the reason for it? They're all on your land. And he's a deer hunter, mm-hmm. so he's kind of smiling and keeping that information to himself. So, um you can see benefits to the growers program. Uh, I'm I see much more hardship driving through the country than I do talking with with uh, growers customers. But even even the growers program, there was struggle this year in Michigan. The early frost what? really 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 uh, didn't didn't help corn that was planted in uh, the end of June, first part of July in Michigan. Sure. Hey, what about, uh, there's guys asking me, uh, what's going on in the sugar beet industry in Michigan? Mudded out, extremely wet. Uh, there's a lot of guys who are wondering what they're going to grow in these fields next year because there's nobody that took off a nice field of beets this year. Um, I never really heard much report on tonnage, but the beets I've seen look to be softball size-ish. They're very small. Um mm-hmm. I don't think the sugar is there this year because they were a late crop. Uh, there was a lot of stuff. Uh, but I know the payment for tonnage, the talk of that, is down. Uh, low 20s, I think, is, is what I've heard for what they're being projected for payment on sugar this year. Um, and um, that's been a struggle. I've seen guys trying to uh, dig beets right after we had two and a half inches of rain and they're digging the next day. So you know what kind of condition they're digging in. But uh, permanent piling didn't start in Michigan until October 14th. And Mm -hmm. you know what happened in a few days or a few weeks after October 14th. Uh, Mm -hmm. So there's guys that had uh, two, three, four weeks of solid digging with the the permanent piling that started in the 14th till the 14th of October, there was very mm-hmm. few days, you know, that you could stop for rain. So they kind of knew that when they started into this, and they were trying to go in no matter what kind of weather they had, which mm-hmm. doesn't make the beet crop a very easy crop to harvest. Do you think there is going to be a fair amount of abandonment of some of these acres that they just aren't going to get them dug? Uh, what's in the field right now, uh, The most of the summer Michigan got about a foot of snow Monday and Tuesday. Um, mm-hmm. I was gone from this area. I was not in the sugar beet area to see what's going on. But I asked a little bit when I got home, and they knew a few guys finished this week. Uh, what they mm-hmm. harvested, I don't know. And I know there's got to be a lot of acres that are sitting yet because it would be a really a big challenge to harvest with. Uh, foot of snow on the ground. I was in the Argray right. area, which is a sugar beet growing area today, and they're stopped because they had two nights of zero-degree weather. 
and they didn't have mm-hmm. a lot of snow cover, so sugar beets, there's no digging going on there because you don't get Frozen. bigger fields to go in the ground after zero degrees, you know, for several <laughs> days. Uh, Absolutely. So I was in, I was in uh, the coldest morning I had this week that I woke up was eight below zero, and the next morning yeah. was zero degrees. So we had a little bit of temperature this, this week in Michigan. Sure. Absolutely. Okay. Hey, I appreciate it, Steve. Fine job. Uh, thank you. No problem. David Armstrong, you're still with us, Dave? Yep, I'm here, Jim. Yeah, there he is. Okay, this is David Armstrong. Dave's from Iowa, and uh, I wanted to get Dave on to uh, talk a little bit about the, the western part of uh, our area. And uh, He's a cow-calf operator and, and row crop, and uh, he tells us a little bit about the challenge that uh, they're dealing with out there. Uh, like I said, when I talked with the guys in Illinois, they, they had enough snow up, put them in neutral too so uh, it's pretty well the the whole belt's been affected by this last storm so david why don't you go ahead and yeah jim uh been a year of first here for me and a lot of other people first time i finished planting corn uh, on june 16th and first time i finished planting beans on july the second i was chastised by one of the neighbors. He said, how can you not run your beans? And I said, well, when you was at the state fair, my beans had only been in the ground for about a month. And he said, yeah. He said, I guess you're kind of right on that, aren't you? And I <laughs> planted, a, planted a different variety, of course. But, Jim, we've this, – this, I'm sitting here in, in, a, in a car uptown Montezuma due, due to a meeting that we usually have on Thursday night. And uh, I slipped out of the meeting and get on here. And I'm sitting here looking up the street at uh, three to five inches of snow, and this is the third time we've had that this year. Mm-hmm. And uh, but I'll tell you, through it all, we've we've done pretty good. I'm not that far along in my harvest. I've been busy with cow chores, but uh, there's guys combining as I sit here right now. They they're even moving machinery through town. Some of the larger operations are running, and it looks like they're getting along fairly well, actually. And uh, we did get dry enough soil before this snow event that it seems like this snow is, is a little evaporative. So when it does leave, it's not leaving. It's slippery, muddy. And that's uh, mm-hmm. that's been a blessing to us. So, um, yeah, we, we've had our struggles. I'll tell you, in western Iowa, along the Missouri River, them poor guys, I I don't know. There's a lot of, lot of bad reports out there. You know, today they announced from the USDA some of the disaster uh, proceeds that they're going to go through, and them guys will be direct recipients of it out there. There's some reporting, you know, they their farms are so devastated they don't they don't think they'll be returning to to some of their acres that they own. So, hmm. wow, uh, kind of, yeah, it's, it's it's a tough deal. I I would like to drive out and see just to put my eyes on it, not to uh, revel in somebody else's misfortune, but just to really look at this. They've showed you know, in the local channels, what some of these guys are looking at. And the one guy was standing by his field on the road, and it looked like a lake. And he said, it's been like that all summer. He said, it started to go away. And then they got the second surge. And he said, it just come right back up. Levees are broke. And they're kind of in a, they're kind of in a bad situation out there. But as far as yields go, variable, you know, it's all over the place. You know, we got some of the early planted stuff will, will beat 200, but, there's a lot of 160 and 180 talk out there for as far as corn goes. Um, coming out pretty decent. Everything's in the early 20s. You guys saying they're taking some stuff out that's just, you know, getting as low as 18. Uh, mm-hmm. Beans are out. Uh, the elevators here started taking beans at 16 and 17 just because guys was going to run them. And so they decided to <laughs> receive them and probably two weeks ago there was a hard dash to get the beans out and uh, it's pretty well done the beans in this area are pretty well done south of here they're not uh talked to a cow calf operator i'm uh, quite familiar with uh, lives five hours south of me in missouri and uh just like us he had we had zero and uh he had five degrees and so 
it's you know I know it reached pretty far south, and that's pretty unusual for them. Now we we warmed up that next day to oh not quite twenty, and he he warmed up that next day to forty. So wow, that's just the difference five hours south of us type of thing. But uh, he tells me that they've got plenty of grass. He's into his fall fescue pastures. They got all kinds of feed. Unlike us, we're low on feed. We're we're scrambling to buy hay and make sure we secure enough feed for the winter for our livestock. We baled hay late due to the rainy weather. Our second, we, then we got into, they called it a, a mini drought. We got into a spell where we, no rain at all, and the second crop didn't recover. A lot of bug damage, and the uh, third crop was just like what Steve Geiger said. Uh, come back real nice, a lot of stuff there. Here's another first for me. I baled mm-hmm. hay after it snowed on it in the in the fall of the year. <laughs> Never done that before. Never. Uh, just 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 an amazing year. It just is. It, uh, oh, a little bit of current events here as far as USDA goes. I know we got a. You can validate this, Jim, but I think we got a date on. If you play the USDA game, you got a date on September 6th to get a sign up done by. Sounds like they're going to uh, allocate the 25 percent payment for the uh, efficiency and the crop, whatever that mm. program was called, and then they're going to make one more decision whether they're going to allocate the last 25%, which it sounds pretty uh, sure or certain that we'll, we'll do something there according to what they were, the way they were talking today out of Iowa State University when they were making a report on our farm radio out here. So Yeah, sure. Um, one thing, talk a little bit about the cattle market as you see it, Dave. Yeah, the oh the cattle market. I I like the way the cattle market's returning. To be honest with you, it's making slow gains, and we see we don't see it backing off. You know, it might waver a little bit, but we gain, we gain, we gain, and just a little bit, little bit, little bit here and there. I tell you, the uh, got a very good friend. I'm in the backgrounding business. He's in the finishing business, and uh, I called him a week ago just to see what finished cattle were doing, and he was bid. Uh, a dollar seventy eight and then a plus premium for, for primes two oh four and he sent a pot load and most of the and quite a few of the pot load, a big percentage of the pot load went prime so the prime leniency is real good so he plus that two oh four out here. But we're probably running you know, in the auction barn uh dollar thirteen, dollar fifteen on the hoof, you know, maybe maybe a few select or I mean a, a few a select few of prime heifers, you know, done right, weighing twelve fifty, probably, you know, they stretch up to maybe a dollar eighteen twenty just to set a market trend. But um yeah, the beef industry is it's stabled out. I, I like the way where it's at. We can kind of depend on what we're gonna do. The at the feeder uh end of it they had a two thousand head run in Russell, Iowa Monday. And even it was cold, miserable day down there. The theme was a dollar forty-five for steers. Five weight steers were a dollar forty-five. Six weight steers were a dollar forty-five, and eight weight steers were a dollar forty-five. And had a good friend took a couple of trailer loads of eight weights down there, and and was very happy with his returns on them. So, you know, the market wants the cattle to be fed and ready to go into the into the hard feed. Uh, system, you know, get the backgrounding done, and they're really hungry for them kind that they're going to put right on feed and, and push them and make them go. So uh, that's as I see it here. Uh, there's a good demand for the feeders out there. Uh, I think once do you do you think a hey, do you but, think Dave the the economy is is allowing that uh, people still want to eat beef, you know, and oh. uh, if they got the money, you know, they're they're going to do that. Yeah. No, I. I think the demand for beef is great, and here's the thing: the Packers are still making that $400 a head, and you know, mm-hmm. us in the beef industry, we say that that's pretty unjust. But right now, we got an issue. I got a friend that owns a sale barn, and and the uh, the cutter, you know, the cutter cows there, they took a pretty bad hit. This weather devastation uh, in Nebraska, and then in the, the Dakotas, you know, the Nebraska was the flooding that they mm-hmm. had and their cattle, and then in the Dakotas with that one foot of snow event about six weeks ago, the, the cows quickly come to town, flooded the market pretty heavy, and and uh, in, one, in one day they told him to take uh, 15 cents off of his bid. So, 
Okay, very good. Hey, David, I appreciate it very much. Okay, yep, yep. Thank you, Jim. Take care. Yeah. Okay, Zach, uh, I think that uh, that's my boys, and uh, that kind of gives you a little uh, situation, what they're doing. Um, uh, we, we've, uh, like I said, we're, our operation, we're pretty well in neutral at this point. We haven't run anything since Sunday, and uh, I'm thinking maybe tomorrow, possibly into Saturday, maybe late tomorrow, Saturday, maybe guys will start up a little bit, but we still got a fair amount of snow hanging on, so that slowed us down. Uh, we're we're emptying bins, going to pull it, and uh, the line's been pretty good there. So evidently, uh, some of these different elevators have been cleaning out too. So uh, I guess that's pretty well the situation here in the Corn Belt in our part of the world, Zach. So uh, you can go ahead and uh, talk a little bit about the calendar. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, guys, for coming on, too. <clears throat> so the November calendar November calendar picture. Uh, did anybody else hear that phone ringing? Yeah, Carla's trying to nail it yeah. down there. Okay. Oh, she said she's got her. All right. So the November – thanks, Carla. The November calendar picture is uh, an Amish customer in western Michigan – who is harvesting corn silage. It's second year corn with fall and spring manure and five gallons per acre uh, plant, uh, at planting. And so uh, the DM for that area is Todd James. He's on the call. And then the customer whose picture it is, is Glenn Miller, who's also on the call. So both of them, as I said, are located in Western Michigan near Grand Rapids. And uh, Todd is Dick James' son, who many of you probably know, who passed away a couple of years ago, I believe. Uh, Todd's taken over for his dad, and so we'll be talking about that a bit too. But to start off, uh, Glenn, are you there? <laughs> are you there, Glenn? I know, I know he was on earlier. Yeah. No, that's right. Carla's hunting him down here. See if she can find him. Okay. Glenn, if you can hear me, if you can hear me, star six yourself. That'll unmute. Should be on. Pardon, Carla. Yeah, he should be there. Yeah. Glenn. She said he's. Are you there? He's... And if you do, are you able to come on, pipe up, and that'd be great. Um, I hear you. I hear you, but yeah, there you are. There you are. Hey, yeah, I can hear you now. Yeah, I'm on here, so. Okay, yep, yep, great. Nope, we got we got you now. We got a little bit of crackle with it. But, uh... Okay. Yeah. Hopefully, Carla can take care of that. But I, I can hear you. Hope other guys can. Oh, there so, you go. That's good. So, uh, Glenn, if you want to introduce yourself a little more, and then kind of talk about what's happening in the picture, um, how your harvesting went this year, kind of how your year went, given all the difficulties we just heard about from the other guys. Uh, appreciate that. Indiana, just just south of uh, the Michigan line, about. Yeah, it sounds like we got a little interference there with when Glenn gets on. Yeah. Uh, how about Carla, how about you, Todd? You... Todd, are you there? Glenn, can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you yeah, hear me? Whenever you're on, there's a, I can hear you, but there's a loud crackling noise. Uh, well, I don't. Whenever you're on, please. I don't have anything here. Don't hear crackling here. No. Ah. Talk loudly. Then. Did you 
keep browsing, John. I think we'll be able okay. to We're just trying to keep it, keep it relatively short so we don't have to drive viewers off. And I apologize for that. Oh, well, okay. Uh, yeah, Glenn Miller. We're located in Indiana, uh, about seven miles south of the Michigan line between Milbury and Shipshawnee, Indiana. I uh, got an 80 acre farm. Wife and I, Margaret, have uh, eight children, six boys, and two girls. Uh, we farm alfalfa corn. Uh, this year we've done some oats. And uh, been on the growers program since 2003. Uh, the picture, the November picture, uh, chopping corn with a John Deere 3970 chopper. Got a processor on it. Now the uh, four cart, you can't see that. It's got a 100 horsepower, better than 100 horsepower John Deere engine on a four wheel cart pulled by four horses. Uh, usually that five acre field that we're in uh, takes about five hours to chop that route with a two two row corn head. Uh, yeah, we've uh, pulled pull wagon beside the chopper as you can see uh, with four horses there. There's six of us neighbors that get together and help each other chop. Uh, this year's been a bummer like everywhere else. We started chopping around Labor Day, never finished till October the 18th. First corn planted, uh, neighbor, first one that chopped, he planted around the 1st of May. And the uh, last one planted July the 5th. And that was harvested October the 18th is when we finished on that. So, uh, yeah, we got a dairy, milk Jersey cows, and keep all the bull calves and feed them for freezer beef. If not, so we don't have enough orders for freezer beef, we take them to Shipshawana Livestock, Shipshawana, Indiana. Uh, on the uh, finishing steers, we use the grower's lick tank and the guy that's got the meat market in Shipshawana, he was out and looked at some cattle and got some limousine jersey crosses. And uh, he said, that's not going to work. You're not going to get fat enough. So uh, we took some Angus to uh, Shipsha that I had bought and put on the feeder. And he didn't buy them because he said they're too fat. So I guess the uh, grower's lick tank is working. Uh, <laughs> everybody that's been getting the uh, freezer beef, uh, a lot of them are asking for Jersey this year. We don't have enough Jersey to reach around, and uh, everybody's just amazed the quality of meat. So we give the credit for that on the uh, on the growers' end, I guess. And on that corn, that field there is right that we're chopping is right behind the barn, right behind the building. Uh, probably the most neglected field as far as calcium end of it. I went back to the 2005 soil samples, and we had base saturation of calcium around 82, uh, and that's been staying right there with hardly any lime added. Uh, Dick James told me you got to get your potential up a little better, get some lime on there. Well, that field there is one of them where if we, in the spring, we've got some wet spots we can't get on the lime, like chopping corn, same field. We had wet spots, so we couldn't get the lime truck in. That picture was taken in 2016. And then after corn harvest, the silage corn was off, we put spells in it. So uh, the summer of 2017, the first I put lime on there, added two and a half ton. Now we haven't had a soil test since. The 2014 soil test was still right at 80% base saturation on calcium. So that's where we're at on that field. Uh, the forage situation in northern Indiana kind of bleak. We had a late, late first cutting, decent second, and then the third and fourth, what little was there we tried to get, but yeah, about a third less hay production than what we normally get on account of the turn dry in August and uh, into September, end of September before we had any rain. This week we had 12 to 13 inches of snow and the uh, cornfields looked kind of like Jim was saying. Uh, nobody's out running. There's quite, quite a bit of corn left to do yet. So, hey Glenn, guess, how many tons do you think you got off in this picture? Oh, right, about 27, 28 tons of the acre I think what it amounted to that year. This year, not near that because we had too much that drowned it out. But we 
still had a decent, the corn was about the same height, but we just we had about two spots, about an acre, and we drowned it out on the kind of the wet. When you, when you planted this, did, did you put growers on the feed? Yeah, five gallons of the acre. Uh, that field there probably gets more manure than any field on the farm because it's closest to the barn like today, and the snow and everything. We hauled manure on there instead of going back further where we should be going, but the way it is, I guess, that's what happens. So, uh, yeah, I guess uh, that's about all I got. Yeah, and I got pictures of, of some of the ears of corn they took out of out that year. Pretty good sized ears, twenty rows, twenty row ears. Yeah, uh, that was a merit hybrid. Uh, Dick James just had a total fit. He was out and he rode with a chopper for quite a while. And when we unhitched for lunch, I invited Dick in. For lunch, I go to Rochester, Indiana, which is about an hour and a half, two hours away from here, and he said I was supposed to have been there in about a half an hour, so I can't. He he was totally hooked, <laughs> right, with, with Mary and Yoder neighbor uh, that runs the chopper, owns the power unit in the chopper. So, uh, and, yeah, Dick took pictures of him standing beside the corn. It was, on, yeah, it was probably the best corn we've had in, in ages on the of that field that year, 2016. Everything just clicked. I started farming in 88. We had a drought then. We had a drought in 2012, but I think 2019 has been more of a challenge than either one of them. So, uh, right, thanks, Glenn. You bet. Thanks for coming on. Are there any questions? All right, then, uh, Todd, are you there? Yeah. Great. So, uh, they said Todd James is taking over for his father, Dick. And, uh, Todd, if you'd like to introduce yourself a little bit in more detail than I did, uh, kind of okay. give us a rundown on how it's been taken over for your dad, and uh, start from there. All right. Well, I've been working with my dad quite a few years while he was using growers. And so uh, I was involved with it uh, from the standpoint more of the application and the conversion of the equipment to use the growers. Um, and I always looked at it as, man, this is this is pretty simple stuff, you know. People see it, they should say, yeah, wow, this works great. I'm going to do it. For some reason, people don't see it that way, especially nowadays. But... Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, is is going through the years before he passed, you know, that was always kind of the plan. I wanted to be able to, you know, step in his shoes when when his time was up. It kind of happened a lot sooner than we thought. So uh, kind of got, you know, a lot of stuff thrown at me at one time. So it's been quite a challenge and constant learning all the time. And I really enjoy going to the meetings and talking with everybody else to learn a lot just in general discussion. And so um, you know, I try to use a lot of the principles Dad had, you know, use pictures. Pictures will help answer questions as you're talking through it. Um, talk at the level of the farmer. Don't try to talk about, you know, all the, the biological stuff until they really understand the, the main theory of how it works and um, his other thing was I'm not going to go there dressed up and driving a fancy car I go there as a farmer so it's a farmer to farmer discussion so that really kind of helps you know take some of the I guess the pressure off was oh I see another salesman walking up to my door so <laughs> For me, it's it's uh it's fun. Uh, I like it. It's a challenge. Uh, a lot has changed, I think, since when he started to where we're at right now, and we've talked about it in other meetings. And the things have changed. It's just it's almost like it's changing exponentially now. 
we're seeing less small farms and a lot more big farms and it's harder to get into the big farms to even talk to them so um you know i go i've gone back to bad sales records and i saw you know it, it peaked and it started dropping off and uh, i just see you know we've lost some of our customers due to either passing away or selling their, their farms off and it's typically a big uh, corporation is buying the land now, um, and when you try to talk to them, I, I guess you know big farmers around me that I, are somewhat neighbors. You know, when you try to talk to them, and it just doesn't, I guess, click in their mind that it's that simple to get a good yield. Uh, one of the guys I talked to after the meeting, I had Jim Helbys at the farm. This spring, we had a meeting with several of the farmers in the area, and, and afterwards, I was talking to him, and he says, "Well, well, what else do you put on?" I said nothing. We plan with twenty-eight <laughs> percent, two by two, six gallons an acre, and four gallons an acre on the seed with growers. Well, what else do you put on? Well, that's just your insecticide. That's it. Well, I don't know how you can do that. Mm-hmm. Well, you, you don't see us pulling around a semi-loaded tanks with 15 pumps on it, trying to pump all the chemicals in the planter, do you? You know, it's, uh, they just don't understand it. They they can't grasp it. But so that's kind of a challenge. Um, but um, you know, you, want, you everybody don't even want to take the time to do test plots. So uh, that's a challenge right now. Um, this year, a couple of things is uh, well, I want to talk about another farmer. He'd been using growers for quite a while. And two years ago, he said, well, I'm going to try this other stuff. I don't remember the name of it, but it's lower cost. It's a mix mix of fertilizers at a lower cost. And he said, yeah, it's lower cost, and you know, growers is kind of expensive. So he used it. I called him the following year, and he said, "Well, yeah, not doesn't work quite as good as growers, but you know, it's still cheaper to use. So I'm going to stick with it." So you know, I even went and talked to him. I said, "Hey, you know, are you putting anything on on the seed to help it pop up?" He goes, "No." So I went to him, looked at his planter, and I said, "Well, here's what we can do. It it'll, it'll help. It'll help. You know, get it to pop up quicker." And, get started and we talked and he was interested in it i gave him some brochures on it explained it called him two weeks later to see if you know, he wanted to start setting the time for me to come over and help him convert his planter and he said no i really don't want to do it right now so you know i mean my god I, I, how else do you try to share the information to say it works why why not you know but that's that's kind of the challenge I see. Um, I helped two farmers this year convert their sprayers to, to use straight growers for foliar feeding versus diluting it with water. As I was talking with them, I, you know, they were using water. I said, "Well, are you are you treating it?" They, no, I'm just mixing water. I says, "Well, you're not getting the benefit out of the growers by doing that. It's all locked up." Well, we put some vinegar in there, so are you testing it to see where you're at? No. So I explained to them, you know, we did the same thing. We, we even treated the water right. And we still saw a better performance going straight growers than having it diluted. So uh, I helped them convert their sprayers over to go straight growers. So uh, How'd that go for them then, that, Todd? Were they happy with that? Well... Yes, um, but once again, it's a bad, <laughs> bad year to kind of measure uh, compared to other years. But um, so the one guy, um, Joe Imhoff, and I think he talked to you because he got different nozzles. I gave him the wide spray, and you gave him the cone spray tip. Oh, okay, I got gotcha. you. Yep, and then the other one we the fruit farmer. So. Um, so anyway, I mean, I, 
it's got to help him. It's going to perform better. I actually stopped by Joe Himhoff's place this year after we had our our meeting mm-hmm. and uh, walked in his cornfields and I got pictures of it. I mean, his corn was every bit as tall as what was in Glenn's picture there. Um, and then in the middle of it, he had some problems where it was small stalks and he had a lot of water and moisture in there. And and that kind of took away from the, the, I mean, they were tall, but they just started to lay over with the wind. Sure. And I don't sure. know if that was blight or what, but, um, but you know, he had a good stand on the outside of the fields, but, um, you, know, you get those potholes in there. You get those wet holes, man. That's uh, that water yep. stands in there. It's hard on the root zone. Yep. yep. Um, then uh, I had a, another farmer just call me about two weeks ago, and he'd been using growers before, but he hasn't used it for five years. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was talking to him, and you know, he said, "Yeah, I, I want to." I want to start using growers again. I said, okay. I said, what were you using before? He said, well, I went organic. <laughs> he said, bottom. We said, we said, bottom line, I'm I'm tired of their crap. Said, All the documentation <laughs> they want, and this and that, and the other thing. And he says, he says I'm just I'm tired of it. He says, uh, what kind of what kind of farmer is he, Todd? I mean, is he livestock or is he row crop? Or hey, vegetable. All hey. Oh hey. Oh hey. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. So um he has oh I forget how many acres he said he had. Not huge mm-hmm. acreage. He's retired, but still I think the the key point is he's tired of the crap satisfy the organic requirements. <laughs> so <laughs> I thought that was kinda of interesting. So, Absolutely. The only thing is, they'll be raising a more nutritious crop now, anyways. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, uh, what, what's, so a, what's, for, uh, I mean, in your area, Todd, what's, what's the situation as far as harvest is concerned? I mean, are guys pretty well done with uh, beans? Are they running corn? Oh, what's no. their deal? No, there's, uh, there's still quite a few beans in the fields. And okay. We we have up in Wayland where I live probably about four inches of snow down mm. by the farm, at least four inches or five inches of snow. And mm-hmm. uh, you know, a, a lot of it's still on the on the leaves of the corn. Sure. So sure. They're, they're basically, and it stayed cold. I mean, today it was still in the 20s. It didn't even get in the 30s today. So they're basically mm. a standstill until, like you say, that corn gets off the leaves. Yeah, yeah. And the beans, what, uh, the beans how, how, how much of the corn is actually run, if you had to take a guess? Half of it? Uh, I'd say less than half. Okay. I'd say maybe 40%. Okay. You know? And then and I drive, I've been going down to Finley, Ohio for my job. Mm-hmm. And as I drive across, you know, I see a lot of, you know, when the weather was good, good they were trying to get it out. But, you know, when that snow hit, last week it just stopped everything there's mm-hmm. still quite a bit of stuff in the fields yet around now, the, us, the, you know the, the area where that, you drive todd is there a fair amount of prevent plant acres that you see from the spring oh for the cover crop right no where they where they absolutely didn't get anything planted at all oh yeah i've seen some yep absolutely Mm-hmm. Yep. Even going down the turnpike, I see some fields. Look, they had, mm-hmm. had nothing in there. Sure, sure. Yep. But um, so anyway, yeah, I'm still learning. Yeah. Oh, Joe. Good to hear you, man. Good to see you down that corn cob Did. Excellent. What are, are you? Are, did you get how much snow did you get, Joe? We had approximately five inches, probably. Oh wow! Holy crap! <laughs> that was enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh. Well, yeah, I 
So, did you... Did, So, did you say you've got all yours out, Joe? Uh, we finished last Wednesday picking, picking the corn. Mm. On Saturday and Monday, it started snowing. <laughs> That's called management. Yeah. So, stressful uh, management. So, Joe, Jim Jim asked the question about going to the straight growers instead of uh, diluting it. Did you see an improvement? Um, I can see that because of the dry dry weed and getting a rain in September. Um, new customer said he's he's very satisfied. He put three applications on this summer. And he's alfalfa field and if not and he said the half that he sprayed with straight growers had a lot more leaves and he got more tonnage. See the difference. Oh, good. Good. So that's a new customer Joe just got. Oh, good. Good. That's good. What's the uh what is the feed situation for you guys over there, Joe? I mean as far as forage is concerned. I think everybody's set pretty good on side corn silage. Um, hay is going to be short. Is it? Okay. All right. Uh, Todd, is there anything else you'd like to cover? No, that's pretty much it, unless somebody has questions. Yeah, anybody have questions for Todd or Joe or, or Glenn? Appreciate it, guys. You did a fine job. Yeah, thanks a lot. You did. So uh, the next conference call will be December 12th at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And uh, since we didn't discuss the October calendar photo, which shows a uh, Phil Neal, spreading lime slurry on the soybean field. He will be coming on in December instead to discuss that. And uh, I'm sure knowing Phil, that will be an interesting call. Uh, Very much so. Thank you, everybody. (laughs) Thank you, everybody, for listening in, and uh, have a good night. Bye. Okay, bye. Thanks a lot, Todd.